let's let's get started. Welcome back. So, like, uh, so I, I threw up here just to remind you of our, our definitions. So the, the, I just yeah, want to continually remind you of so these three fundamental definitions of algebraic spaces, the Lee-Mumford stacks and algebraic stacks. And then remind you that what we did last time was uh, we showed that these, these definitions actually imply that the diagonal is representable. This is this, the, the main theorem from last time. That the diagonal of any algebraic space is representable by schemes, uh, and that the diagonal of an algebraic stack is just is just representable. And then this allowed us to finish this algebricity of quotients theorem here in the bottom. We'd already done some of that, I guess, two times ago, but now we can take quotients of smooth groupoids, etal groupoids, and etal equivalence relations. Uh, and what's next up is, and what I'll cover today is. Uh, sort of getting into like properties of algebraic stacks and the geometry of algebraic stacks. We're gonna define notions of dimension, tangent spaces and residual gerbs. Uh, so yeah, let's get started. Well, maybe before, yeah, I'll just take some, I could take questions if, uh, if there are any. Okay, so yeah, so recall that, so dimension is a, is a tricky subject in algebraic geometry, you know, even in just scheme theory, it, it takes some, some time to develop the basic properties. Uh, and uh, if we have a scheme, the dimension of it is, is the dimension just of the underlying topological space. Uh, that's the Krell dimension. And you can, you, there's also this local, this local uh, dimension as well, which is the minimum over all open neighborhoods uh, containing your point. And this is sort of necessary because there's like, there's pathological, like in, in general, your scheme may not be pure dimensional. I mean, what to think of is you might have sort of multiple components. And then if your point is here, you don't want to say it's, it's, it's locally dimension one around that point. And uh, so what we would like is a corresponding notion for first X. I mean, the definition's on the right-hand side, but, but uh, we can't just, even though we have the underlying topological space of an algebraic stack, we don't wanna use that as its dimension. Uh, and we'll see maybe later why. I mean, an example to think of is just BG, which is just one point. Uh, instead we wanna use, so like, instead we wanna, Basically, uh, the goal is we want to define the dimension of an algebraic stack using a presentation. So like if you have a smooth presentation, X, like I'll just put this in quotes, but this is essentially the definition, although we just have to work, be, uh, be careful, is that this should be the dimension of U minus the relative dimension of this map, of the smooth map. Um, right, okay, so let's get into the specifics here. I, I have the definition on the, on the right-hand side. We take, uh, so I, I need to, yeah, let's, I need to first define it for, for algebraic spaces and I'm only gonna restrict to the Ethereum setting. So if I have an Ethereum algebraic set, algebraic space and a point, um, I, just, I just take a, a tau presentation and I define uh, the dimension as the dimension of that tau presentation. And this is all fine, it's well-defined because it's the tau maps have relative dimension zero. Great, and now, we can then use that. Uh, I mean, we need to define the notion first for algebraic spaces because we're working in this, we're working with very general algebraic stacks whose diagonal might only be representable by algebraic spaces and not schemes. Um, so, so yeah, so here we take a, uh, an algebraic stack and a point and we choose a, a smooth presentation and you can consider the corresponding groupoid. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll write this over here. So we have X is our 
algebraic stack, we have u over it, and we choose a, a pre-image. And then if you take this fiber product, this is R, right? And that's that's your, your, your smooth groupoid corresponding to that choice of presentation. And uh, you also have this identity section here, E. So you can consider E of U, whoops, that's not E of U as a point in R and right, it's over under both projections it maps to U. And I can also consider the fiber under, over, uh, over U here under, let's call this, this map, uh, yeah, this is S and this is T and let's call R U. This is sort of, this is the pre-image under T. And yeah, so then we, we define the dimension just to be the dimension of U minus the relative dimension, meaning the dimension of the fiber R U at, at E of U. Okay, that's our definition. What we need to show is that it's well defined. Um, but once that that's true, what, once you show that, then you can define uh, a sort of the global dimension as the supremum of all of the local dimensions. So this is unlike the case of schemes where you first define global dimension and then local. Here we've gone, yeah, gone the other way. Uh, okay. So what I owe you is, is, a, a, is a proof of this. I, I do want to give some details or some in, indication of why it's true. Like I, I, I think, I also, I don't think the details in this, in, in this case are so inspiring. So I'm going to go quickly here, uh, but it's really one of those cases where it's better done on, on your own. And it, yeah, just because a lot of these things are subtle. And uh, so I, I, I've sort of cheated and wrote down sort of a sketch of a proof for why it's well-defined. And so up here, I have the same setup I wrote before, right? And then this local dimension is, is defined as, yeah, as this difference. And what we need to, what I want to argue is that the, it's well-defined. And there's basically one fact about dimension that we'll use is that uh, if you have a smooth morphism of schemes, so you have a smooth morphism of schemes and you have a point X mapping to Y, uh, then the dimension of the total space, whoops, that's the eraser. The dimension of the total space is the dimension of the base plus the dimension of the fiber. Okay. And so we, we in order to show that it's independent, we choose another presentation. Uh, and then we have a corresponding groupoid R prime and let's choose, we can also choose a, yeah, a U prime going to an X. And here we might have uh, a point U double prime mapping to U prime and U. Uh, and by symmetry, you know, it suffices to show that basically we're trying to show that this di dimension is independent, uh, this relative, this difference is independent of the choice of U so by comparing U and U prime to U double prime, it suffices to show this equality at the bottom. Um, and, right, so uh, in order to show that, we, we can sort of consider, we wanna apply this, ge this geometric fact um, and we consider sort of this fiber product that diagram. So we have our three different presentations here and, uh, and so we're going to apply, and maybe we note that uh, this fiber here is equal to just uh, because this is u prime over x. So if you consider what our setup was, this was in our notation, this is the same as r prime u prime. And so we apply the fact to this smooth morphism and uh, and what that just tells you, the fact just tells you that you get this equality, but we can read, but because we have that, uh, this identification of U double, of the fiber of like U double prime U, uh, we can, um, yeah, we, we then get this equality. 
And, and if you note that in this in this second equality here, uh, it, there's two terms that are the same as in this one, namely, so I could substitute in for the dimension of u minus the dimension of u double prime. And so what we see is it, it actually suffices to show this equality. And for that, it's actually, yeah, that, that's not so hard. So here, I, just for simplicity, I just assumed that all of these points have the same residue field. Yeah, and, my, and in general, it, it works because if the dimension is insensitive to uh, field extension. Uh, and, and then, so you can consider this Cartesian cube. And you look at just the back square. You have a fiber product square, and then you use and and these are all uh, sm uh, like smooth and finite type over a field, and so it, and, and so you have the additivity of dimension. Anyway, that was really quick, and yeah, but I don't think yeah, as I said, I don't think it's that interesting, so I don't want to really dwell on it. Yeah, I'd rather discuss examples. So essentially from the definition, if you have a smooth affine group scheme uh, and you have an action on another scheme, U, uh, on a K scheme, then the, the dimension of the quotient is just uh, the difference between the dimension of U and the dimension of G. And so for in specific examples, the dimension of BG is equal to negative of the dimension of G. So like the dimension of B of GM is minus one. So we, have, we are in the world of negative dimensional geometric objects. Um, and on the other hand, if you take you know, A1 mod GM, then you have something one dimensional acting on something one dimensional. So you get something zero dimensional. And you know, similarly, say if I just take A2 mod GM with this with the scaling action, then it's one dimensional. And this sort of makes sense because you know, inside here you have a copy of P1. Uh, but something something that's tricky in this example, it, it'll show up later, is that you also have this closed substack, and it's it, it's co-dimension two. Which also makes sense because yeah, this has dimension minus one. Um, and now, if you try to think about mg, can we compute the dimension of mg yet? You know, we had this description of mg as a as a quasi projective variety mod uh, pg some pgln, where this was some locally closed piece of the Hilbert scheme. And some Hilbert scheme of like tri canonically embedded curves. And so this does tell you that the dimension of mg is the dimension of h prime minus the dimension of the group. Um, and you could try to use deformation theory to compute these things, maybe just to, yeah, to, to show that the Hilbert scheme is smooth uh, and then compute its tangent space. Um, but we're actually gonna follow a different way. We're just, we're, so I'm not gonna compute the dimension right now. Uh, we're gonna wait until we know that it's smooth and then we'll compute the dimension of its tangent space. And so rather than working with the Hilbert scheme, we'll just work directly with the stack. So yeah, we're gonna return to this later. Right, so that's, that's my quick survey of, of dimension. Are there, are there questions? Yes, I have a question. So do we know that uh, all uh, algebraic space come from some, um, so, so yeah. can you take the first page? Yeah. Can you go back to the first page? Oh, sure, yeah, uh, the, the very first page. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, 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 no. The second, the second page. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Do we know that uh, all algebraic uh, spaces uh, come from some R and U? Some R and U, yes. Right. Because any by 
right, right. But because by any by definition, any algebraic space has an etale presentation. Um, right. So yeah, if X is an algebraic space, you can take an etale presentation. And because this is representable by schemes, the fiber product is also a scheme. And then, you know, I I I I showed that there exists a U mod R last time. And the fact is that, yeah, if you if you start with X in a presentation and build the, the corresponding etale equivalence relation and then take the quotient that you, you get back what you started with. Does that help? Yes, thank you. And this is the same if we take a stack and a smooth presentation? Exactly. Uh, well, yes, except that, except that uh, we, yeah, that, that if you take, if this is a stack instead, uh, we don't know in, that your smooth presentations are representable by schemes. So this R here might then be an algebraic space and we have not, we, it's possible, but we have not yet. Uh, we can't take a quotient in that, in that setup yet. We, we, we only define the quotients of smooth equivalence relations of schemes. You can extend that in the case where R is an algebraic space, but I, 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 yeah, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm avoiding this. Okay, but then I suppose uh, when we take the fiber RU in this definition too, then this is a, a scheme. So it should be still well-defined. Uh, oh, well, I think this is, uh, in, in general, this, this, this is just an algebraic space. So that's why I needed to define the dimension of an algebraic space first to make sense of this. Okay, sorry, I got confused because um, wouldn't R to you be representable by schemes then? No, not necessarily. No, not necessarily. In, yeah. Okay, I see. Thank you. So since we're dealing with negative dimension, is there any um, geometric picture that we should be? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. How do you view this geometrically? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, my picture of BG would just be a point, but you, you sort of remember G. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like in topology, they have other ways to that view be, like these classifying spaces, and then they're not negative dimensional, but infinite dimensional. But, like, hmm? No, no, I, I, um, I got it. Thank you. Because I, I did attend a talk, and they, they have a I think a simpler definition of BG in topology. So I get to make that. Okay, let's move on now uh, to tangent spaces. Uh, and we're gonna follow sort of, uh, we're gonna define this a risky tangent space um, of a stack and we're gonna use the dual numbers. So here we, we fixed a point, a K point. So we have a, a map from spec K to X and we just define the, the Zariski tan tangent space formally as all maps from the dual numbers um, that extend this choice of object. Um, but because we're working with stacks, we need to be a little careful. These are really two commutative diagrams um, and, so, and you need to mod out by isomorphisms over the dual numbers, right? So this this defines it as a as a set. And you know, unlike like in the case of schemes, you you, you can define the tangent space differently, right? Because you have you have if you have a point, you have a local ring. You can look at the maximum ideal, and then you can take you know, m mod m squared or its dual, and that you you clearly get a, a vector space, and then you show that there's an identification with maps from the dual numbers. In this case, we're just using the dual numbers to define it. So it's not so clear what the vector space structure is. And so here I explain how to get uh, first scalar multiplication and then we'll move on to addition. Uh, scalar multiplication is easier. You simply like if you have, you have a tangent vector tau, so that's tau and uh, you have some scalar C. And then all you do is you precompose by just 
uh, by scaling epsilon by by c. Now, it's, yeah, it's an interesting exercise to to check, even in the case of schemes, that this is that this is the the corresponding vector space structure to m mod m squared. Um, but unfortunately, uh, uh, addition is a little trickier. So what we're going to use is this equivalence, and this is uh, this is like it's not it's not easy. This is, not, this is not easy, but what, but one way to think about this is that uh, um, is that I have sort of a diagram where I can include into the, the dual numbers right and then and the corresponding maps of rings are surjections and I could take the fiber products of rings, not something you usually do, but you can and and, uh, and then you have a, if you take the fiber product, of rings here. What the, what this algebra looks like is just it looks like two tangent vectors glued together. Um, and what what we what 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 you need to show is that this is a push out um, in uh, yeah it's push out in the in the category of algebraic stacks. Yeah, this takes work. But I, I think in the case of affine diagonal, I think that's the case I wrote in my notes. It's it's not it's not it's not too hard. It still takes some work. Um, and, and what that means is that if the push out, it means that if you have I'll use a different color like a map to some other algebraic stack X, to some algebraic stack X, and an isomorphism here there should ex exist a unique map. And another way to phrase that push out property is exactly you know this equivalence here. And so I view that equivalence as a push out property and then um, but it's also yeah kind of sort of important to point out that this, this type of equivalence uh, naturally shows up in deformation theory uh, in in terms of uh, in like local deformation theory it's like one of the first axioms in, in Schlesinger's uh, axioms in order to get um, that would yeah to get a representable hull of a local moduli functor. Um, and it turns out, yeah, and this is sort of part of a package. Maybe I'll say a word later, but this is sort of a part of a package that uh, that builds that builds up to Artin's criterion, which gives you like specific local criterion to check that an, uh, uh, that an algebraic stack that that a certain stack is algebraic. Uh, and yeah, this is one of the first like homogeneity properties. But in any case, you can just you you can just check that this is this holds for an algebraic stack. And we're going to use this to define addition. And it's essentially, what we do is, uh, I mean, yeah. What you do is you, you have, in order to add two tangent vectors. Uh, so if you if you use this equivalence, right? Because okay. So in this equivalence here, you have tau one alpha one uh, and then a tau two alpha two on the on the right hand side so that using the equivalence you therefore get uh, get this map here oh, sorry you get this map here and then we, we, we sort of and then you just add the tangent vectors Where both, maybe I should write it this way on algebras epsilon. Okay, and so this this gives you a, a vector space structure, and so what I tried to outline was was this proposition here. Uh, and I only it's true more generally without this affine diagonal condition, but uh, yeah, as I was saying, the push out property is a lot easier with that pro with that hypothesis. And maybe as an, as an exercise, I'll, I want to say that, uh, that this, this tangent space is naturally an algebraic representation of the stabilizer group, where at least set theoretically, uh, 
that if you have, suppose you have an element of the stabilizer and then you have a tangent vector then you act essentially by pre by precomposing your isomorphism with uh, g right in other words to think of g, g itself is is just you can think of g itself as giving you like a two isomorphism between like the the map X, the, the object x and x and you just and alpha was this two isomorphism between these other maps and you just precompose with that two isomorphism All right, i think turning to examples is, is useful so we have, so I'm going to, I'm going to go through a couple examples. So let's take G to be smooth and affine, uh, an algebraic group. And I'm going to take X to be just the canonical cover of BG. And then because G is smooth, The tangent space is uh, is trivial, or maybe uh, yeah. An order, if if yeah, if you, if you like, you just think for a moment that K is algebraically closed, uh, right? Then this map corresponds to the trivial G torsor, and then there's this, and then so th th then uh, then there's this fact that every G torsor over the dual numbers is, is also trivial because with smooth groups they're trivializable in the Atal topology, and there's only any and any a tau cover of the dual numbers is just like a, pro, a, a disjoint union of copies of the dual numbers. Uh, and so and there, yeah, there was where we see that every extension of the trivial G torsor to the to the dual numbers is also trivial. So that means that the tangent this tangent space is zero. Can I ask a question? Yes. I guess. Uh, uh... I guess we don't, maybe we don't have a good notion of smoothness that lines up this way, but somehow, sometimes we think about smoothness as meaning like the tangent spaces are the right size. And so for these negative dimensional things, it seems like this will never be true. Yeah, that's a good question, Gabe. Can, can I, I'm gonna, with my next example, this will show up. So yeah, oh, I'm gonna okay. address that. Great, thank you so much. So yeah, let's, let's take uh, a one mod GM. And we, you can consider two different points here, right? Remember, this is this this is the an algebraic stack whose underlying topological space has two points, one open and one closed. And in fact, the open point this is is an open yeah is an open immersion. And then you have uh, the complement of that is a closed stack BGM. But I can take a cover of that, and then this is. Let's call this point zero. Um, the tangent space, let's call this stack X uh, of X at one. Um, well, it should be. This is this isn't this is an open immersion. So certainly, I yeah, I, it's it's just it's equal to yeah spec K. So it's a zero. It's it's zero dimensional. The tangent space is identified with the tangent space of spec K at the unique point, which is zero dimensional. But on the other hand, the tangent space. At the origin uh, is is one dimensional, just because a well because yeah a one is one dimensional, and but and note that here that the stabilizer of G one is is just trivial, and it acts trivially here, and then but the stabilizer of the, of the origin is G M, and that acts here. So as Gabe was sort of saying that, like a, the, we haven't defined smoothness, but this is an example of, of a smooth stack uh, of dimension zero. And what we're seeing is that the dimensions of the tangent spaces are not constant; they, they jump up. But when the tangent, when the dimension of the tangent space jumps up, so does the stabilizer. So it's like is the the difference between the dimension of the tangent space and the dimension of the stabilizer is constant as long as you have a smooth algebraic stack. Um, and with smooth stabilizers. 
And maybe as another example of what can go wrong in characteristic P and when you don't have smooth stabilizers is you, you can look at B mu P over a field K, say a, a positive characteristic. Uh, and we have this cover. Note that we don't actually know it's algebraic because we haven't taken quotients. We're not taking quotients by flat group schemes. Uh, but, but actually this argument I'm gonna say right now will show you how to, what will give you a way to actually show that it is algebraic. Uh, so I wanna argue that the tangent space yeah, of B mu P at this point X is actually one dimensional. Um, and that, so yeah, this corresponds to the fact that mu P yes, yeah, it's, 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 there are, uh, yeah, not all G bundles are trivializable in the atal topology. Uh, you have non-trivial, non-trivial deformations of the trivial torsor over the dual numbers. Uh, and, but yeah, one, one way to, to, to think about this is mu P is the quotient of the multiplication by P map. So this is exact sequence like this. And like, yeah, whenever you have a short exact sequence of groups, you can realize, you know, the classifying stack of the first one as the quotient of this action. So actually B mu P, you can view it as GM ma gm, where the action is by taking t goes to t to the p. And so this gives you a way, at least we know that this is an algebraic stack uh, because this, uh, and this gives us a smooth presentation of, of b mu p. But also with this presentation, you can compute its dimension. And, and this tells us that the dimension is zero. So sort of a, a weird example, you know, topologically, you have the stack b mu p, which is just a point. Uh, it's, it, it's, it actually is a smooth algebraic stack of dimension zero, but it has a one dimensional tangent space. Okay, let's get to a more geometric example. Let's do it. Let's, let's, let's turn to MG. And let's do G at least two. And so we're gonna fix a curve. Yeah, where, where C is a smooth, projective, connected curve of genus G. And, and, and uh, at first, I'm just going to retranslate what the definition of this tangent space is. Well, it's, it's uh, well, by definition, it's just all extensions. modular isomorphisms. And this, if you think about what this is, you know, this tau is then a family of smooth curves over the dual numbers. Uh, and such that the central fiber is isomorphic to the curve you start with. And again, modding out by isomorphisms of the total family. And here we're going to now just use a fact. Uh, it's actually not a very hard fact, but you know, it, it's worth a, a lecture in itself to discuss. To discuss it's uh, is that you can use this is a fact from infinitesimal deformation theory. Is that you can identify this with H one C of T C of the tangent bundle. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, and so this gives us a way to compute it. So then we just need to compute tangent bundle. And uh, yeah, yeah, okay. So H1 of the tangent bundle, we could use their duality. So this is a same as H0 of C. Uh, I mean, this the curve is one dimensional. So this is just the dual of the dualizing sheath. And the Sayer duality tells me this is the same as the sheath of differentials or the dualizing sheath tensor two. Uh, and so, and, and because this is positive, because the genus is at least two, there's no H1 here. So we can use Raymond Rock to compute this. 
there's no, okay, let me not write that. There's no uh, H1, and, and then Riemann Rock tells me I take the degree of this. So I have two times the degree of the canonical, which is two G minus two. And then I need to subtract uh, a G minus one. And so I end up with three copies of G minus one. So we get that the dimension of MG, yeah, so we compute the dimension of the tangent space of MG at any smooth curve uh, is three G minus three. And so this is very close to, to knowing that dimension itself is three G minus three, uh, but we're gonna wait until we discuss smoothness. Can you explain, can you explain in the second example, A1 mod GM, how you saw the dimension was one at the origin? Because like it's not it's not enough to just know a one has dimension one because that's also true at the other points, right? Yeah, that's a good point. I didn't. Yeah, I, I didn't prove that. Let's see. Uh, I fear I'm not going to get a, a yeah be able to come up with a great explanation on the spot. Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, this is related to something that's going to show up later. Is that you know is that uh, in fact the map from a one. This is sort of a mini versal deformation in that it induces an isomorphism at the tangent spaces of this cover, but that's, yeah, I, 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 but I need to, yeah, I need to show that. Uh, I, I guess it's clear, yeah, and yeah, okay. I don't think it's that hard, but yeah, I, I don't think I'm gonna find the most succinct explanation on the spot. Any other uh, questions I can't answer? Yeah, sorry, I have another question concerning three. Um, so, so are we using here like we are probably using um, the the that we are on the etar side here right now? Um, otherwise, this um, sequence is probably not exact, right? Um, because we are having like Henselian rings or something like that, such that this map is subjective. Oh yeah, right. Uh, yeah, this is only yeah, right. Uh, okay, yeah, I didn't want to get into this. Sorry. Yeah, I, I, you need to use the flat site for 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 to this, yeah for both BMUP and, and for these exact sequences. Um, and I yeah right. Let me not really get into that because I haven't we, like I, I'm giving these examples for BMUP because I think they're worthwhile to keep in mind. But we're we're not we're, we're yeah we're not developing the foundations because we don't even know it's an algebraic stack. No, yeah, it's a fair question, right? Yeah, I think just on the small and big house side, this works. Which works? What works? Uh, that, that the sequence is, is, is exact. Uh, but you needed the flat topology. Uh, yeah, let's, well, yeah, we could, yeah. Let's oh, sorry, okay, yeah. discuss it later. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Jared. A uh, less technical point. I think the last thing you wrote on this page should just be 3G minus 3. Oh, right. Oh, my God. I did the same error when I was writing up my notes. That's OK. Yeah. Not, not as uh, important, but. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, no, it is important to point out because, yeah, not everyone might realize it's an error. OK, now we get to the most challenging part of this lecture, which is the res residual gerbs. And I sort of regretting that I'm doing it this early. I mean, residual gerbs is a tricky subject, like regardless, but it's especially tricky for us because we don't know that much yet. And so there's kind of many ways to show these things, but we, uh, yeah, but we're, uh, you'll see that I'm going to struggle because we don't yet have, uh, yeah, a lot of the foundation. Can I ask a, a question about yeah. uh, example two? Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there was this question about how we can tell that point zero has one dimensional tangent space. Um, so is, is it right to think of these tangent spaces as being like the uh, tangent space as like the tangent complex mm -hmm. and you kind of forget the grading? Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, I think that, yeah, that, right. It's sort of the tangent complex is the one that's, uh, more well well behaved, right? Okay, cool. 
So it's like it's like it's uh it's like it's a graded one dimensional thing. Like it has nothing in degree zero, but it's it's got something in a non zero degree. Yeah, yeah, you, I guess you could yeah, right. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks. Right, so, that, so let, let's first recall what we know about with, with schemes and what we're really after here. That if X is a scheme, and X, and you have a point, then, um, well, there, I don't know, yeah, then there exists a residue field Uh, okay, of X and, and moreover there and, and there's and a monomorphism. There's an occlusion from the residue field. And so our goal essentially is like we want an analogous construction. I mean it's not going to work out exactly the same way, but we want, yeah. Uh, so it would Basically, what we want is given x, given a point uh, of an algebraic stack, we want uh, to consider sort of uh, the smallest substack of x containing this point whatever that means. Right. Uh, okay. And so, in, in, and in fact, okay, so this is, yeah, as I said, tricky. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to restrict to, uh, I'm going to restrict to finite type points. So let, let me introduce the definition. We say that a point of an algebraic stack is a finite type. If there exists a representative with, with such that this morphism is a finite type. And maybe I should point out a, a, a sort of a fact for, for schemes. If X is a scheme, X being local, X being finite type is equivalent to it being locally closed. Closed in some open set. Um, and maybe a, 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 to, an example to think of where the, you have a finite type point that's not actually closed is if you take R to be a DVR, K to be the fraction field, then this inclusion, right? This is an open immersion, so it's certainly finite type, but it's an open point. And, and, but, but for schemes like finite type over a field K, any K point is closed. This is not true for algebraic stacks. Sorry, could you recall what finite type means in this context? Because it's not a local property. Oh, oh, but it is it, being finite type is is a local property. I mean, uh, on on the on the well, the source and target. I mean, it, we we actually define what it means to be finite type for any morphism of algebraic stacks. Here, this map is we know in this case we know this is actually representable, and so uh, you can define so it's you can just define it in terms of. Uh, mapping schemes into the target X 
and requiring that every fiber product is, is a finite type algebraic space, or that is, yeah. So we, we actually have, we have developed what, what it means for morphisms to be finite type. Okay, I will have to read up in the note, but thank you. Does, does the field in this definition, the spec K, um, does that have to be the same as the one that, the one uh, that's just a representative of, of X or like? Oh, uh, wait, in... The, well, the so point I, X. I guess so. so yeah, in the definition of an algebraic stack, there was no, there was yeah, there's no field. But when I was maybe like here, uh, you know, maybe you're you thinking about schemes of finite type over a field. No, I'm saying like you say that a point in the space associated to the stack is a finite type. If there exists oh. a representable arrow from spec K for some field K, I guess. Oh yeah, this has to be, this is, oh yeah. Okay, this is confusing. Let me, see. yeah, I, I think I, 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 too many shortcuts. Uh, so yeah, this representable doesn't mean, yeah, yeah. Okay, if there it, it is a representative of X. Okay. Where, where this morphism is a, is a finite type. Yeah, not that this map is representable. Right. Remember, we could, we define the topological space of an algebraic stack to be sort of the equivalence class of all field value points. And here I'm just I'm fixing an arbitrary point. There could be many representatives, and I'm and, and, and being finite type means there's one representative, uh, which is a, yeah, which is a finite type. It won't be true, of course, that all representatives are a finite type because you could just take some huge further field extension. Um, Jared. Yeah. I think one of the confusions is that if, if the diagonal of X is really bad, then I think you want to say locally of finite type everywhere. Right? Oh, is that? Yeah, that's a fair point. Okay. But, uh, and that will maybe clarify what was asked before. And then of course it's a local property, both on the source and the target to be locally a finite type. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, let me just add that. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, but yeah, I'm gonna restrict. I, I'm gonna restrict to X being Noetherian in any case, and then and then there's no there's no distinction. Uh, then I need to add. Oh, so you can define that. You can also define a finite type point, right? So yeah, with, if if X is Noetherian, then like being locally. A finite type. So let me just add this maybe in parentheses, defining two different notions here is equivalent to being finite type. For, for in this setting of a, of a point. <laughs> okay. Uh, right. And so, okay, uh, going back over here, like it's useful to keep in mind if you have a, like a scheme, like a variety defined over a field, uh, then any. Any rational point or any or any point defined by like a finite field extension uh, is is necessarily a closed point. But with algebraic stacks, you can have like these rather benign algebraic stacks like a one over the complex numbers mod gm, and this point you have a c point which is not closed. Right, okay, so uh, well, now we're gonna work towards the definition of a residual gerb. And right, again, the goal to keep in mind is that we're considering the smallest substack containing X. And we're gonna define it in terms of a presentation. So, yeah. So let, let me try to walk you through this definition. So we fix an algebraic stack and a point we, we take a smooth presentation and then we, we, we define the residual gerb as sort of the substack uh, defined by the stackification of, of, of the, the substacks of, of, of objects which factor through uh, your choice of cover here. Um, does that make sense? Uh, yeah, so, all right, you have 
let me draw a picture. You have u over x, and then you have the inclusion of the residue field. And in the pre-stack, you're forcing, it, we're trying to define the residual gerb pre, and so that you're forcing like an object, oh no, I used s. An object here, by definition, is something that, that factors through here. Um, and then what, what you can show is that, okay, is that if X is Noetherian, this takes some work too, that this is independent independent of uh, the presentation. So, and, and, and maybe, uh, okay. And yet maybe another way to think about this is, uh, you know, you, if you could choose a, if you choose a finite type representative, you know, of, um, you know, of your stack at like X, then what you really want to do is like then then this thing, gx is sort of like this the the is like sort of the stack theoretic image of this map. Like if everything were sheathed, then it would be the the, the sheath image. So we're sort of taking this to be, yeah. We're, essentially, this pre-stack is defined as the pre-stack image, and then we're just sheathifying, stackifying. And what I'd like to show is that. So the following true, so this, this theorem I've, I've written below, this is true in, uh, in greater generality than I'm stating here, but I'm imposing yeah, that one that is Noetherian uh, and I'm only doing it around points that are a finite type with smooth and affine diag stabilizer. Um, this makes the argument easier, but you will know, see that it still requires some work. This is, and I'll just say in words that this is, this theorem is true. You can look it up in the stacks project. It's true in, in for, for arbitrary points without the smoothness and this affineness assumption on the stabilizer. But okay, but the, the whole point is that this residual gerb is an algebraic stack. And with these hypotheses that it is, is a locally closed uh, immersion. Um, and moreover, so if I choose a smooth presentation, then the fiber product is exactly sort of the orbit of, of the corresponding groupoid. Here, look, look, let me just explain that this orbit O of U is sort of as, as sets, um, it's just this, this S of T inverse U, which like this is a, as a set, this is just, if you think about what this is, if you take the pre-image of U under one of these projections T, then what you get is relations that look like uh, V. So it, yeah, what, what this is, is it's all points V such that there exists a relation with source V and target U. So it exists this in R. And, uh, and if you think about it, yeah, if your groupoid came from a group action, this is exactly the orbit under that group action. This it's, it's as a set, it's all elements equivalent to you under yeah, under some relation. And so the sort of the upshot of this theorem is that we give is that is that uh, the orbit is is locally closed, so we can give it the reduced we can give the orbit the reduced. Uh, scheme structure, reduced uh, scheme structure as a locally closed subset of, of U. And I, I, I think it's imp important to compare this with the setting of uh, in equivariant geometry. Like if you have an algebraic group acting on a scheme U uh, and say things, everything is a finite type over a field K, 
then it's sort of one of the first facts you prove in algebraic groups is that uh, any G orbit, at least, yes, say take of a, of a, of a K point uh, is locally closed. I mean, yeah, the point is that you have this map from G to U, which takes G to G times U and, uh, and its image is locally closed. And this is kind of what we're after an analogous fact in a greater generality for stacks. And maybe before going further, let me just give you a, like an example. And I'm gonna to turn to A1 mod GM. The residual gerb of the open point, oops, is, is just the is spec k, right? Because that's, yeah. Uh, this is an open immersion. Uh, but, and the residual gerb of zero is, uh, is BGM. And then if you see what happens under these fiber products, in this case, you just get, you get the origin, but here you're getting A1 minus the origin, right? And these are, these are the two orbits under the A1, under the GM action on A1. And let me just put this uh, in like in the cloud, like Ravi does, because I'm not gonna I'm not gonna prove this, but I think it's important to keep in mind is that in yeah in general, this uh, this residual gerb is a gerb. So I've defined residual gerb. I haven't defined it a gerb. So this is only useful if you know what this means. Um, it's a gerb over uh, a field that that we define as the residue field at that point. And so sort of the picture is you have your algebraic stack and you have uh, an inclusion, which is even locally closed if you start at the finite type point. This is a gerb over field, but it might not be trivial. But if you, if, if you, can, you can take, it is trivial after a tau extensions. So after an a tau extension, this becomes trivial, isomorphic to the stabilizer group, um, maybe of, a point x prime. Okay, any any questions with the definition? It's probably a lot of questions. It's a confusing construction. So okay. if I remember. Uh, Go, go ahead. Yeah, so if I remember correctly from your notes, one of the exercises was to show that in general, the notion of a, in general, you cannot speak of a residue field of a point of an algebraic stack. Oh, if the exercise is in my notes, you mean? Um... Yeah, that the generic point like A1 over Z didn't have a residue field. You can still talk. I mean, well, so there's okay. On one hand, there's this discussion of like what sort of like with, with weirdly non-separated algebraic spaces or stacks. Okay, may, maybe some of these constructions don't work, but let's refine ourselves to an Ethereum setting. Um, and in that case, every point, even if it isn't a finite type, every point has a both a residual gerb and a residue field. But I'm only going to prove it in a restrictive setting. Okay, how do you define then the residue field? Oh, well, I would well, first define the residual gerb and the definition I gave is the one that works in general. And then you have to prove that the residual gerb uh, is a gerb over some field. And then that field is defined as the residue field. Okay, so this, I think it's something you don't want to like cover in detail right now. Right, yeah, yeah, I wanted to sort of skip. There's a lot to say here, yeah. And I'm trying to okay. yeah. All right, Got so yeah. this statement in the cloud then it's something that only works in like a nice enough separated situation or something. Oh, no, I, I do it sort of, 
Uh, oh, and now I need to reconnect. No, I, when I put things in the cloud, it's sort of like when Robbie does it. Sort of well, uh, uh, it's just meant that this, I'm doing this for your own edification. This isn't like, yeah, we don't have the the background to prove these things rigorously so yet, but it's sort of just good to know. Okay, thank you. I didn't understand the purpose of the cloud. I never oh, attended I see, Robbie's yeah. course. Sorry. Do you have an example of a non-trivial residual jerk? Oh, I wanted to give one, but I couldn't, yeah. Uh, it's easy, yeah. I don't really have a great example for that. Yeah, I, yeah, I like, yeah, I would like one. I'm sure there is one, I just don't have, yeah. I guess if you know that there is a non-trivial gerb over a field, you should get a... Right, yeah, but you know, yeah, what's your easiest construction for that? I mean, you could try to take like B of Z mod two, over um, and like try to oh say oh, yeah take that over the complex numbers and then try to use a non-trivial gluing of that uh, to descend it to spec R yeah that, that works but there's yeah it's, it's not it's not so one easy yeah easy to state okay so what I want to want to do is is sketch this proof uh, at least in a special case and so I, I've, I've State it again, the theorem up there that we're after. And I'm going to prove it in the special case, uh, oh, in, in, in kind of sort of in a geometric case where you have a finite type, we, we have an algebraic stack. Uh, remember, it's always assumed the theorem. And that's imposed further that it's a finite type over a field and that x is a rational point. So, for instance, if, yeah, this is. Like say, take k to be algebraically closed. So if you're working over the complex numbers, um, this yeah is sufficient to handle it. But uh, yeah, and uh, the first step is I want to construct um, a morphism from the classifying stack of the stabilizer to the stack. And so recall. Okay, so I'll hit this. I'll I'll do. Well, what is even is the definition of this? So it's the stackification of the pre-stack where the fiber category uh, along a, at a scheme S, this is simply the category of one object. And, 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 and where the morphisms between that object are precisely the s value points of that group scheme. And so this gives you a way to define a morphism of pre stacks to x, where where, you, where the unique object goes to you know, the corresponding um, object of, of the stack X over S. Namely, you just, yeah, you, you take the projection to the spec K and then the inclusion via your point. And then on morphisms, it does, yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah, it just move, yeah. Uh, morphisms is defined in the obvious way. So, you, so we have this morphism as, as a pre-stack, so therefore there exists by the definition of stackification this map here. And note that this map up here is this is I'll do this yeah. This is a monomorphism of pre-stacks. And what we saw is that therefore this is is a monomorphism of stacks. Um, and right, uh, so I, yeah, so that, that handles, oh, at least that, 
So yeah, we, we get a monomorphism. And, but we also know that, you know, there's a smooth cover of this. And this map is X. We're assuming this is finite type. So that implies that by descent that this map is also finite type. So now we have a finite type monomorphism and the goal is to eventually reduce to the case and we're going to try by, by, by replacing X by both opens and by closed and to show that it's an isomorphism. And so in the next step, I'm going to show uh, not only that it's finite type and a monomorphism, but I, I, I can reduce to the case where it's flat and surjective. So I first, I can assume that that this map has dense image simply by replacing, you simply replace X with the smallest closed substack um, containing the substack BGX. Okay, and now, uh, okay, this is a sense. So if you look at this composition, this has dense image. And this is a representable morphism. And so by descent, by applying generic flatness um, and applying it, in, you know, uh, using descent and applying it in the right way, uh, you can actually, you actually, generic flatness implies that this map is generically flat, but it has dense image and you're mapping from spec K, so it's actually flat. And this implies that this is the GX is flat. And therefore, we're going to use this, and then, and then, uh, and, uh, yeah. So there, that gives us the flatness. But we also have that as a finite type. So this map is flat, a flat morphism of of Noetherian stacks of finite type. And so you can use descent to prove the the, the familiar fact that uh, flat and finite type morphisms are open, and the image is 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 open. So since the image is open, we just replace X with that. And so we can assume it's like that is surjective. And so that now we finished step two. We have a finite type monomorphism that's flat and surjective. And now we want to aim to show it's an isomorphism. Okay, so this is the, the final, with these, with these reductions, I want to show that this is an isomorphism. Uh, okay, and so I have BGX mapping into X, and I have my cover U, and let me just write my hypothesis here. This is finite type, um, it's a monomorphism, it's surjective, and it's flat. And I simply take the fiber product. I call it O because this is sort of, this is like the orbit of the groupoid. And this by, by construction, it's in, it's an algebraic stack, uh, but it's also a sheaf. We don't, it, it will turn out, yeah, we don't know that it's an algebraic space. It's one reason why this argument is tricky. or a scheme. We don't know yet, don't know yet. Uh, okay, but we, we, we can certainly assume that, that, you know, it's local on U, so we can assume U, let's just assume U is, is, is affine. So that, and, uh, but what that tells you is that at least that um, because U is, is affine, uh, and this map is a, uh, this map, this inclusion, you know, the, of O into U 
has the same properties as BGX into X, you know, this map is finite type, a monomorphism and flat. Uh, and, and particularly because it's a monomorphism, yeah, the diagonal of, of O inherits the properties from the diagonal of U. And so we at least know that the diagonal of O is affine. This is just a technical thing that we'll use later. And so let's, I'm going to make an assumption here. So let's assume for a moment that we know the following. Let's assume for a moment that we know that, that O um, and U are, are sheaves in the big FPPF topology. A priori, we, we just know that they're sheaves in the big tau topology. And, and then now, so we're gonna try, because they're sheaves, what I want, and, and O is a monomorphism inside U, I wanna show, show that they're you know, equivalent as sheaves, that, this, that, 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 yeah, that O to U is an isomorphism of sheaves. And if I use the fact that they're sheaves in the FPPF topology, uh, I just need to show that it's sort of subjective in the FPPF topology. So this tells me that it suffices to show that um, for all maps T into U, in other words, I have T into U and, and I have O here, that I need to show that there exists some T prime F, that's FPPF over T and a lift to O. I need to show FP, I could lift, yeah, sections FPPF locally. And I, and I do this sort of, yeah, and I can do this sort of in the obvious way I have, I'm gonna do it over here. O to U, I have T. So the first thing I do, remember this is just an algebraic stack plus sheaf. So I take OT and then, um, so because this is an algebraic stack, I choose some cover so now this, I could choose this to be a scheme and I could choose this to be, uh, I could even choose a, a smooth cover. And then I take the further fiber product, O tilde T and this, let's see if I get this right. Uh, you, you was, yeah, T is a scheme. U is a scheme. Oh, and so this, this is definitely a scheme. And right, this map is smooth and surjective. But we know that this map is, is, is flat and surjective. So this composition is, is FPPF. And so we, we take T prime to be this lift. So this does show that then O and U are, are equal as sheaves. And therefore, that yeah, BGX is isomorphic to X. <laughs> wow. Okay. But and the one thing I owed you, I don't want, really want to dwell on it, but I do have this sort of a page explaining this missing fact here. So the missing ingredient is that uh, is that it, like so uh, I'll state this as a theorem that any algebraic space is a sheaf in the FPPF topology. Uh, and in fact, if you if you take a, the sort of the natural argument for this. Just like the argument in Le Mans Murray Belli, uh, you actually see that it extends, like in the case of our setting, to an algebraic stack plus a sheaf, as long as you assume that the diagonal is representable by schemes. And for us, we just reduced immediately to the case of being representable by affine. Um, here I've sketched the argument, but I'm not going to yeah, walk you through it. Maybe we can return to it later if we use it again. But I think uh, it's a good time to end. I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs>